Thank you. Um, I'm, it's not obvious in which uh, Kristen uh, said, but I, I've got swine background as well. I've, I've been doing poultry for about a quarter of a century. But uh, my advisor in Minnesota was Al Lehman, uh, as well as Gary Dial and Will Marsh. So if you know these names, uh, you know they're in the swine business. So I'm very pleased to be uh, here uh, in Ames. Um, my topic is not as sexy as the first two speakers, and I also it didn't occur to me to put pictures of naked women as well. Um, but you know, it's in, in biosecurity. I could probably come up with something with uh, shower and shower out facilities. So we'll see. If I cannot uh, grab your attention for the entire talk, I'll uh, start with uh, basic stuff I want uh, to uh, stress, which is basically that biosecurity principles and what we do, the measures we do in the 21st century, we've been doing that for hundreds of years, okay? Going back thousands of years. So we have not invented anything. Uh, but uh, the reason why we've been doing that for so many years and it's been working, it's because it's scientifically sound, but we forget often uh, to consider that. Uh, for example, disinfectants. We have good products out there, but often we don't consider the contact time that's needed for the product to actually work. Regional biosecurity, it's a big deal. When you have big farms uh, all in a small uh, region, uh, it's not the same thing as uh, when you have smaller facilities. And, and we have data on that, but we neglect that. And the main point is compliance. We know what to do, that doesn't mean we do it. And I've got data to show you on this. Uh, finally, uh, on-farm biosecurity is cer certainly essential, but it's not enough. Uh, we need to go regional. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that. So. Um, to start with going way back, uh, if you look at the Bible, you're going to find in them in there uh, a lot of the biosecu biosecurity principles and measures that uh, we need to apply, essentially. The context is different, uh, but the principles remain the same. And throughout history, we've had situations like the plague, where they didn't know what was hitting them, but they pretty quickly figured out how to uh, try to prevent it. The, la the, la the latest uh, major plague uh, has been AIDS. And for those of you old enough, uh, I just celebrated the 21st anniversary of my 39th year. So uh, I was pretty much in it when AIDS hit. And uh, back then, we didn't know what it was, but we figured out very quickly how to prevent it. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, although we knew how to do it, and even today, a lot of people are still not applying the control measures to prevent this disease. Um, so what are these principles uh, that are constant throughout history? For on-farm biosecurity, there's two, okay? I challenge you to find a measure of biosecurity that does not have something to do with reducing the contaminant reducing the source of contamination, or separating the healthy animals from the source of contamination. That's it, okay? Well, they'll talk about internal biosecurity, external biosecurity, biocontainment, all these things. It's nice, but at the end of the day, all we're trying to do, whatever the site, is to reduce the amount of potentially contaminated material or animal or equipment and to separate it from healthy animals. Uh, in the 15th century, they actually, um, they actually came up with, uh, when people had leprosy, uh, with what they called a mass of separation. Okay, not now, but later, Google it. You're going to see that in two paragraphs, in, uh, you have an ancient text where all the measures that we need to apply on farms are there. They explain to the individual who's affected, you know, how to go and get water without contaminating the water for others. They explain how to stay away. They even say, if people question you and you're in the prevailing winds, you know, make sure the wind does not go from you to them. This was 15th century, okay? So we've known for a long time how to prevent diseases. 
And the third principle, of course, is communication. And that's a challenge. Because we have bigger farms, we may have a smaller herd overall that was mentioned this morning, but we have, and we have more efficient, bigger facilities, uh, and these facilities are very close to one another, that changes the game, okay? And so we need to, take a, uh, to, to realize that. We have plenty of data on this. As you can see there, this is data mainly about poultry, but there's one per on swine. Whatever, even bacteria are more likely to be an issue if you have proximity between two sites. So we have the odds ratio there, two more uh, times more chances for Salmonella, Newcastle, and poultry. E. coli, six times more at risk if you're within uh, a kilometer uh, from a, an infected site. We have plenty of information on this, and it's nothing new. Um, Goodwin in 85, that's 20th century stuff, okay? Looked at mycoplasma infection in pigs and said the two risk factors associated with reinfection, it's where the farm is and the size of the neighbor. So what have we done since 1985? We've increased the size of the neighbor and we got closer to the neighbor, essentially. That doesn't mean that um, it's, it's not financially a good thing to do overall. But what it means is that we need to look at biosecurity a bit differently because we have a changed environment. The animals are not the same, uh, and we've changed, uh, not only climate is changing, a lot of things are changing. But essentially what we've been doing is increasing the infection pressure per square miles, essentially. We have more, uh, you know, we have the wind, of course. Um, a lot of people like to think that it's the wind that brought the disease on their farm. Uh, but that's not often uh, always the case. The fact is, if you have a big regional, uh, high uh, regional density, then you have more insects, you have more animals, you have more wildlife, you have more people, more equipment. All that is increasing what we call the infection pressure. If you want to see the ultimate, well, go to China, okay? That's a swine farm in China. Uh, and um, I mainly go there for poultry. Their poultry farms can be much bigger than this. Okay, uh, there's one that I saw that had 37 commercial buildings on the same site. So I know that in Iowa, you've got six million uh, bird operations and stuff like that. They go way past that. Um, but you would think, well, uh, if they do this, they must know what they're doing. And uh, on top of that, they uh, certainly must apply good biosecurity and, and apply what we know about things like disinfectants, for example. Well, I'm a bit concerned there. I was a speaker last year at the uh, Lehman China conference. Um, to get access to the site, okay, we had to go through a tunnel. It was about a 60-foot tunnel, um, and we were obviously being fumigated. So I asked what it was. There were two products in there. One I did not recognize. The other one was lutaraldehyde, okay? Uh, I, I guess, you know, you all, we all need to die of something. But, <laughs> but I mean, this is not going to do it as far as disinfecting people or even equipment over a 60-foot uh, walk. Uh, so, I, and I, I've seen other things there uh, that explains a little bit why China has been a reservoir for a lot of pathogens. Uh, and as you know, in poultry, in our case, uh, uh, they're the source, a uh, big source of avian influenza. Now, we know the risk factors. This is results from a small study in Quebec where I come from, uh, and where they look at PERS. And basically what you see there is heat producing unit, essentially the size of the farm. The bigger the size of the farm, the greater the risk, 10 times more at risk. Uh, distance between uh, closest uh, pig site, well, seven times more at risk if you're within 2.5 kilometers. No shower at entrance, uh, so no pictures to show next time, uh, I suppose, but uh, eight, nine times more at risk. Uh, and access to the rendering truck, rendering is not a bad thing per se. Renderers uh, who do a good job, uh, do what they can, but they're coming from different sites. Um, I've worked in France, actually I've consulted in 26 countries, and in France, 
uh, a renderer goes on 44 uh, sites per day. Um, and they have no idea uh, what they may bring to another site. Um, as a matter of fact, you don't know what may be in it uh, when you go to a rendering container. Look at this. This is obviously a picture from Canada because what you have in there is the head of a moose. You know, how did it get there? We don't know. And that's the point. Um, we don't often know uh, when we go to a site, to a place, if we're exposed to anything that could eventually spread elsewhere. But rendering, whether in poultry or in, in swine, has been a known risk factor. So what we're trying to do, of course, is to try to prevent any of these bugs to make it to uh, the animal. The animals. So that's why we have this shower in, shower out type facility, or at least a three uh, zone entrance, right? A classic one where the key point here is that you decontaminate your hands in the mid zone. Uh, because I go on many farms in swine and poultry where you may decontaminate your hands, but after you've put on the boots from the farms or the coveralls from the farm, it's too late. Okay, the, the purpose of the middle zone is for hand decontamination and also to bring a distance, separation, again, is separation between the outside and the inside. We often see this as a problem. A lot of growers, uh, technicians, veterinarians, um, they don't fully uh, either understand or or apply that concept of separation. So technically, even if you just have a line, you should be able to go from potentially contaminated boots, changing the boots as you go over the line and have non-contaminated boots. This way you have no contamination. What we see, whatever the country, and I've spent 13 years in the United States, I've seen it too here. You're not worse than anywhere else, but you're not that much better either. Um, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Um, is that people will actually put like plastic boots on the contaminated side. I see that in vet schools quite a bit, where they cover their shoes with a plastic boot and then they put their foot back where they were. So this way, if there was contamination here, you bring it, you essentially, this is bringing contamination on the other side, even if you do then a very nice jump over that line. Okay, and then some would actually go straight on the clean side, or what we call the clean side, where the animals are, and uh, then they will change uh, boots, and you have contamination. I wanted to see how real that was, and you know, there are some people that will come with a powder that will glow in the dark and stuff like that, um, but I wanted to do better than this, so I asked a colleague to, to produce a bacteria that could glow in the dark and uh, using bioluminescence, uh, ATP bioluminescence, he did. And so basically we recreated a contaminated environment. We did a change of boots that would be appropriate and you could see there's no light here. But if you have, you, you put your foot back there before you go across the line, you get contamination. And with the bacterial, uh, uh, this was the worst uh, when you do it this way, and two-thirds of the time, this is what we see. Uh, the French just got hit with 485 outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza, and they have been on several farms, and three-quarters of the growers actually do that. Um, and so, and over 10 meters, about 10 yards, uh, that uh, contamination keeps going. It's not really going down much. Um, here is less contamination if you change once you're on the clean side, but we could find contaminants all the way for about uh, 10 yards. Of course, uh, when you don't change boots at all, then you've got a contamination all the way through uh, the ante room, uh, all the way to where the animals are with no dilution effect. We also looked at a proxy for a virus, uh, a T4 bacteriophage, and basically, here you have uh, control clean uh, with a, a proper change of boots. So the boots are contaminated, but there's a good change of, of boots, and bang, it goes down to zero here. Now, what you have here is essentially a first step. In this case, the boots were put in the clean area. 
and uh, with the bacteria that was not as bad as changing the boots in the dirty area, uh, but for the viruses, uh, it seemed to be a high level of contamination there. But after that, you see a drop. But the contamination keeps going as people walk through the anteroom. Um, and of course, overall, a lot less contamination uh, than if you don't, you don't change boots, uh, which is something we unfortunately see. So basically, this is what we conclude. Um, changing boots the wrong way will reduce contamination, but it certainly does not eliminate it. Uh, some people would say, well, you know, then all you need to do is you add a foot bath. You know, so if you messed up a little bit, you go through a foot bath, and there you go. Except that, in reality, foot bath actually increase contamination. When you go through a foot bath under commercial conditions, this is what you do, <laughs> okay? We have studies on that, okay? Cindy Amos did a good study, and here is some of the article there. And basically, she said, well, you know, based on what we looked at, uh, unless you uh, scrub the boots, remove everything visible so that you have like, like a boot that looked like it's brand new, then you would have to soak the boot for at least, depending on the product, here they talk about five minutes. Then you achieve disinfection. Okay. Now I raise your hand, those of you who do that. No, not even Generation Z would, would, could be, you yeah, know. <laughs> anyway. You know, the point here is, we knew that long time ago. Here's um, guidelines from OIE. OIE is the uh, uh, Animal uh, World Health Organization. They still have guidelines like this, where they say, well, you know, use a foot bath, uh, as long as you can soak your boots for a few minutes. If you don't, well, at least it's a reminder that biosecurity is important. I mean, that's crap to me. I mean, you know, if it's worthless, it's actually worse than worthless. We have um, in poultry, uh, Bob Owen went on poultry, uh, did a study on poultry farms, and so kind of uh, regular conditions, and look at phenols being used in foot baths, quaternary ammonium, and, and these are good products if they're used properly, see? But we neglect the science aspect of it. And um, after three hours, actually, look, they increased the bacterial count if you use these foot baths after three hours. The re uh, we always say change it daily or when you feel it's appropriate and all that. Well, you know, daily won't cut it, okay? Water is actually a bit not as bad. So um, now some people have an emotional attachment to foot baths. I've discovered that, <laughs> uh, serious. And that would not be Generation Z, that would be my, my kind of people who have been changing foot baths for 30 or 40 years. And they say, we, understand, we hear you, we, we see your data, but, but you know, if we stop doing this, it's like they are denying everything we've done for the past decades. And so I say, well, I've got, I've got an alternative, you know. Um, try dry foot baths. Okay, um, because if you look at phenols and quaternary ammonium, this is another study that was done by Owen, and, and basically, uh, change in bacterial count, um, you know, uh, was not uh, great, actually. A bit of a reduction here, but it's nothing. You, you go from several billion pathogens to a few billion pathogens, you know. And here you have an increase, and residual life less than two hours. At least, the uh, a dry bleach seem to reduce a bit. You don't have to change it daily. Um, and, and basically, I think it's mainly the coating effect uh, on the boot that would be uh, useful. Now, there's a study that was done on influenza virus uh, after all the problems you had in the United States uh, that we've had in the world. Um, and they look at whether the virus, an influenza virus, uh, that would be put on a, a, a boot that has like organic material. If you go through a foot bath with um, good products, look at that, quaternary ammonia, glutaraldehyde, that's one heck of a good combination. Uh, and uh, basically, right there, a fresh solution, you had time zero, forget about a day or two or three later, it's just, you know, can we isolate the virus after people have gone through the foot bath? And the answer is yes, okay. 
uh, but they could not do it with a dry bleach. Uh, so that doesn't mean that it's perfect, but I say if you really feel you need to have a foot bath, um, well, try to go with dry bleach. And another thing is try to respect the principle of separation because essentially a foot bath should be a bit like the shower, right? The difference between this setup and a foot bath is that here you're going to walk through the foot bath from one zone to the other zone. I've got a great collection from many countries. I just put a few there um, where it's impossible to do that. You know, it's in a corner. And, and this is not a good product, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, look at this. How can you go forward? There's a fence. Okay, now my favorite is Cameroon, right here. Does that remind you of anything? Look at this, you know, you see that in Catholic churches at the very least. I, I've got more faith in this than in that, okay? <laughs> Seriously, I mean the principle is simple. Keep things separate. If you have to step in something and go backwards, you have not accomplished any, any, anything. And that brings me to the problem with compliance, okay? Uh, people are people, and if we can get around something, we will, okay? And, and that is not necessarily just cultural. There's a, some cultural thing. I mean, I've seen amazing stuff in France. You really need to go and visit that place, not just for, you know, the, what they have to offer, but it, 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 they have a mosaic of, of productions, and they do things pretty weird. For example, in the southwest of France, 60% of the commercial poultry operations have backyard clocks on site. Think about that. It's as if you would have somebody bringing a few pigs from who knows where on your farm and uh, just for, you know, because it's cool. Um, <laughs> now, Look at this, we're not talking uh, high-tech stuff. Uh, this is in North Carolina. We had problems with Mycoplasma galoseptacum. So I did something very simple. I went to see people who had the problem. I asked them, for example, well, do you offer coveralls for visitors? Okay, and I just went to a neighboring farm within two miles that had basically uh, uh, birds at risk as well. And I said, well, do you offer uh, coveralls? And look at the difference. 65% said no for those who had the problem versus 12% for the farms that didn't get the problem. We're not talking high-tech so, like, high things. So, and I've seen that. I've done research on this in the United States, in Canada, uh, in France, uh, in Mexico, always with the same results. And I wanted to go further and really see uh, how far, uh, you know, the, the second speaker was talking about the tribe. Okay, well, do we have a tribe attitude? Do we do things differently in the industry? And so I, I, I designed a project where we would film people uh, getting in, uh, in the ante room and, and getting into where the, the, the animals are. Um, and when I went to the, um, uh, you know, ethic committee, they say, well, you can film people, but you have to tell them. And I said, well, that's, that's not really what I want. They say, well, you need to do that. But they say, you know, you could, um, you could basically set up a bogus camera if you want to, um, where the animals are, for example. That's not, you don't care about that. And, and you tell them that they're going to be filmed. And, um, yeah, and, you know, they may assume that they're going to be filmed by this camera, and you just film them with another camera, a hidden camera. I said, that's ethical? They said, yes. I said, well, this is cool. <laughs> so, so what I did is um, we contacted a technician uh, from the Canadian Secret Service, because we have uh, that as well. And, um, and this guy, actually, you, got the, you see here? This is a wide angle a camera that's um, activated if there's any movement. Uh, it actually uh, looks like a screw. We have four screws. It looks identical, okay, except that one is a wide-angle camera. Um, and you can record and, and see what is going on. Um, so we did that. Uh, we basically had a control group with no intervention. We had an audit group. We did three audits over six months, and we, you know, we monitored two weeks at first, and then six months later, another two weeks. We did that. We had posters and all that. Uh, you're not having a stroke. If you cannot read this, it's because it's in French, okay? But, and then we have visible camera. 
uh, where he had a visible camera as people would get in. We had a big sign saying, you're being filmed, okay? Follow the procedures. Here are the measures, all right? And we did that two weeks and then six months um, later. Um, and for the control groups, uh, this is what we got. Uh, about half of the, uh, the times the change of boots was done right. Uh, logbook, signed only a third of the time. Coveralls, a little bit better. Uh, hand washing, 36%, and the reason why we hit 36% is because 20% of the employees were women, okay? If we would have had only men, we would have reached maybe 20, 22%, all right? Uh, uh, men don't wash their hands unless somebody else is there. Go to a public uh, bathroom, okay, and you'll see us all washing our hands, but that's because there's somebody else in there. As soon as there's nobody, most men just won't wash their hands. Um, I mean, that's a fact, okay? <laughs> Overall compliance, 35%. Now, you know, you may be thinking, well, you know, this is a study done up north in a place where they talk funny. That doesn't apply to us. Uh, well, we have the same results no matter the country. And even in human medicine, they have a big issue. This is data about compliance going from 100% to zero, number of months, and this is regarding people's health. You know, people who have diabetes, who have hypertension, have uh, asthma, basically they may die if they don't follow what they're being told by the, the doctors. And look at the drop in compliance after a few months. Okay, um, that's why, you know, people are people, whether they are in the street or on a farm, and that's a big issue. Overall, we had at first an impact with the camera, but not at the end, it went down. That's why our reality TV works. When you see people doing stupid things on TV, uh, it's because they forget that they're being uh, watched. Uh, the, the audit didn't work here, uh, but all it shows is that being audited by a veterinary student doesn't work, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that audits are not good, but it has to be done by people who have some kind of authority. And you look at the control group, uh, here we had put a poster with the measures, that was the only intervention. It had maybe a bit of an impact, but we are around 30, 25, 30% uh, compliance. You cannot control diseases with this kind of situation. Um, I, there's a lot I could show you. I'm going to limit myself to uh, just one, uh, two more slides. Uh, boot changing, um, visible camera at first, yes, not after. Duration of visit, that's interesting. The reference, here is the odds ratio, okay? The more it goes this way, the more people are complying. Like here, if the visit is over 54 minutes, mainly at first, it would be over 30 times more at risk of complying, okay, of doing things right. And so you see that the longer the visit, the more people will comply. Uh, the reference is uh, a visit that's less than five minutes. And so I don't know if it's because people are thinking, well, if I'm going in and out rapidly, maybe the bugs won't figure it out. Uh, <laughs> Or, or maybe they're just saying, well, um, you know, it's not worth doing all this change, washing hands in the oil, because I'm just coming in and then coming out. But obviously, contamination can occur. Um, presence of an observer, that's interesting, because we always assume that if somebody else, like in the public bathroom, uh, you would have a greater compliance. We've been working with an industrial psychologist who told us, well, here's the thing. If you have an employee trained to follow people, visitors, monitor them, and explain to them the rules, yes, you're going to get much greater compliance. But if the person is not trained and is just being asked to be with the other individual, what you have here is a social interaction, okay? And let's say that primaries are going on in Iowa, and I won't get political, but uh, obviously the person does not agree with you. You start talking about things. You're going to forget washing your hands or stuff like that, okay? Because you are involved with the social interaction. Um, and, and the other thing uh, I want to stress is regarding respecting the different zones, okay? Uh, the longer the visit, the lower the respect. You see, the, the odds ratio becomes negative. Okay, so obviously the longer you stay there, the more likely uh, eventually there will be a lack of, of a breach 
of, of the respect for these two zones, the, the different zones. And uh, growers' family. We found that a lot of the uh, people not really working necessarily on the farm, but members of the family um, would uh, basically not uh, comply. Uh, the other thing is we had 250 people, uh, on, uh, 24 farms, about 250 people. We monitored 3,000 entries and exits. 11 of these people were not, were, no, were not known by anybody, okay? Because we would do a, a freeze frame. The grower knew we were doing this, okay? So we, we needed the, uh, the approval. Uh, so the way we knew if it, we were talking about a technician or family member, stuff like that, is that we would show the image, the freeze frame of the individual, and the grower was, would tell, well, that's my wife, that's my son, stuff like that. And 11 times, it's like, yeah, I have no idea. Okay, so, so, so why do we behave like this? Well, essentially, there's a litany of reasons for it. Lack of knowledge is a big one. You should never underestimate it. In North Carolina, we invited uh, workers from uh, a breeder farm to, uh, to talk to them about security. And one guy came to us and says, well, thank you. I says, I've been here 15 years, and nobody has ever talked to me. So I said, in 15 years, you've been working on a British farm and nobody talked to you about biosecurity. He says, no, no, nobody has talked to me. He says, for example, they told us, come tonight at, at uh, the main office. We thought we might get fired, okay? We were not even told why we were supposed to be here tonight. Uh, and you'll see if I have time, you know, it's a key thing here. Adults want to know why we ask them to do something. And so and they didn't know about uh, disease transmission, vertical, horizontal concepts like that. They had no idea. Um, there's, of course, uh, e economic constraints, and, and, but lack of training goes with lack of knowledge. Um, lack of incentives, I had time, well, so a few things like that on that. But then difficulty to apply suggested measures. Um, I have data, I don't have time to show on this. This is an extreme case where you have the entrance and uh, you have a, a line. You have the two zones. Now, unless you work for the Cirque du Soleil, there's no way you can do things properly, mainly if there's somebody else with you. This is another uh, slide showing that you need even imagination to see the separation between the two zones. Um, so that's a big deal. If it's easy to do something, we tend to do it. If it's complicated, doesn't seem to make sense, then we won't. Um, beliefs, attitude, uh, education, experience, we have a lot of data on that. I'll mention a bit about personality because people's personality is associated with biosecurity compliance. Can, what can we do to increase that? Well, the first thing is getting buy-in. You need to get people, even employees at the lower level to contribute to the program. Uh, you need to train them, provide them with incentives. There are negative incentives, like you're fired. But you can have positive incentives, and it does not have to be money all the time. It has to be realistic, of course. Uh, it has, I mentioned, it has to be easy to do. If you can put markers so that you can verify, that's uh, even better. And we need to use technology. I want to stress here that uh, a big issue is that uh, of communication uh, with all the employees on a farm between company management, the service people, the vets, all these individuals, and the people on the farm, there's got to be an element of trust going on. Um, and, uh, and that's what I call the main axis of engagement. And we should not forget the utilities companies. In North Carolina, we had a situation where a company was subcontracting a reader, um, a meter, a meter readers. And, and they changed the company, didn't tell anybody. And overnight, uh, we had a bunch of people going on farms to read meters, and they basically had not been trained at all when it comes to biosecurity, and they were going farm to farm. Uh, communication is a big issue. Uh, Stephen Covey, in 2003, was uh, uh, participating in a, a leadership forum at NC State. Uh, they called that the uh, huge uh, Shelton uh, Leadership Forum. Uh, General Shelton was a uh, joint chief of staff, uh, I think under Clinton Bush 43. And, um, a, and he basically had this leadership uh, forum. And Stephen Covey was saying, you know, we've been talking to a lot of companies and did studies, and we realized that 
in a company, uh, the upper management will communicate to other people in the company. 100% uh, of what is communicated will trickle down to about 3% of being accepted or acted upon and stuff like that. So what's going on? Well, he said, when we ask employees um, if the objectives of the company were clearly stated, 42% said yes. Um, they ask, is there a commitment by upper management to achieve the objectives? Well, one in five said yes. Uh, do you feel the company has the discipline to achieve the objectives? Half of them said yes. Uh, do it, are they enablers? to allow you to, to help you achieve the objectives? One in 10 said yes. Um, is there a collaborative effort, um, uh, culture, collaboration culture out there in your company? One in three said yes. Uh, trust, one in three. And accountability, and that's interesting, one in two said, yeah, I would be accountable if I don't reach certain goals or stuff like that. I was involved in a study where we look at an infectious disease situation and we asked the employees, if I could prove that you're the cause of the biosecurity breach, and it's because of you that we have this problem, what would happen to you? One in two said, I don't know. I thought it was remarkable. Okay, so whether it's a, a, a GM or it's a swine or poultry company, I think there's some similarities. And, 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 and if you don't have good communication, uh, it becomes a big problem. Because when it comes to compliance, uh, one thing we know, is that people who are at the bottom, the people uh, shoveling manure, uh, doing like, like the most basic jobs on a farm, uh, they tend to consider themselves as so not important that if they don't follow the rules, it may not have much of an impact. They're not important, okay? They're being basically told you're not that important, right? You're not as important as a CEO. But in terms of biosecurity, these people are very important. So they need to be trained. And when we talk about training, we're training adults. Um, nobody hears a child. Nobody, everything I've been saying from the beginning uh, is uh, you've been looking at your own experience to compare what I'm saying to determine whether you agree or you think I'm full of, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, that's how it works. When you're an adult, uh, I'm going to stress only three points here. You need to know why uh, you're being asked to do something. Um, you, uh, you will use your past experience to challenge what's being told to you. Um, and you need to know that as you age, you get a bit slower up there. Okay, I've got a daughter who's a psychologist who keeps reminding me this. Um, it's actually on my birthday on the 24th. And, um, I, I, but the good news is, although you're a bit slower as far as learning, you actually can integrate better, more complex things because of your experience. And that's why older people can still be very effective uh, compared to a child because, you know, even if we don't learn as quickly, uh, we can integrate knowledge better. Now, I said I would talk about personality traits. We looked into that. Uh, banks, when they hire some people, they, uh, when they hire anybody, they will have these people take a test to figure out who should be in contact with the cash, who should have a different type of work in the bank. The idea is not to fire anybody. The idea is to figure out where they would best fit in the organization. And so we looked into it, and there's about 25 personality traits, and that has nothing to do with culture, okay? Whether you're from the US, Canada, Europe, doesn't matter, okay? These 25 personality traits are the same, and three come out very associated with boot compliance and visit compliance. The odds ratio here are pretty low, but that's because there were 12 levels. So basically, between the two extremes, you would have like the people who have these personality traits very strongly would be over 10 times more uh, likely to comply. And the traits are sense of responsibility, being action oriented, and, and uh, having uh, a logical, rational approach, uh, and being able to uh, use complex strategies. And so that could be used potentially to select individuals and also to determine um, even how we can motivate these people. So I've got one slide on incentives here. No matter who we are, we have eight desires, okay? Uh, and, and you can see them uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, you have 
these eight desires, doesn't matter who you are. And the idea is to apply this, like for example, ownership. Now, um, when I talk about ownership, when it comes to biosecurity, why can't we get the employees to help uh, define, improve the biosecurity program? If they do that, they take ownership. If it's their idea, they're more likely to comply. Um, I've seen on uh, Swine Farms in Minnesota uh, achievement, reaching targets. I got on a farm and it said 508 days without PERS, you know. Uh, so these are actually incentives that can be uh, useful. Now, um, when it comes to unrealistic expectations, you know, I said I had uh, no pictures of, of ladies, but here's one. Um, and a smiley pig. Um, in, uh, if you remember around 2000 when we had foot and mouth disease in the UK, uh, I can tell you that swine uh, companies in North Carolina were saying, well, if you're going to go on vacation in the UK, uh, when you come back, you can no longer be on the farm for several days. And so one company said one week. Uh, another company said we're better than them, so we'll call it two weeks. Uh, and apparently there's a company that said we're better than all of them, so we'll make it three weeks. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is people will lie, okay? Uh, when it gets too extreme, people will just lie. Uh, so one, for example, decided, well, what we'll say to them is, come back on a Friday so that you can change clothing and take a few showers and don't use clothing from your uh, uh, trip abroad. And, and uh, the first day or two, uh, you'll do work without being in contact with the pigs. And after that, you should be fine. I mean, something like that, people will comply. But if you go too far, uh, at the bottom, there's a, a story where we had a farm uh, where the, their demands on the employees were, uh, were crazy. And so uh, one employee actually got a spouse working on another farm to help early in the morning. And that guy was on a farm positive for mycoplasma infection. And, and we found the same strain of mycoplasma on that other farm. Everybody lost their job. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Markers. Now, here's a, a good example of a marker. This is a farm in the south of Mexico where I was the uh, second visitor in five years. And the reason for that is because I ended up taking 13 showers on that site on that day. Okay, so that was bad enough. But on top of that, when you took a shower after that, the clothing they would give you is this. And if you are Mexican with any self-respect, okay, you will not be cut dead or alive with shorts to start with. Certainly not red shorts. What they were telling me is, we know that farm clothing stays on the farm, okay? Uh, and the reason is because nobody wants to steal this, you know? <laughs> and, you know, some need more training. <laughs> All right, so, component of good biosecurity bio strategy. I could not talk about all of it, uh, but training is one, having proper equipment, sanitation products, applying it correctly, okay, having the right contact time, um, monitoring sanitation, uh, feedback to all personnel, I'll mention a few things on that in the next few minutes, uh, having an easy to comply, the farm design is important, uh, the, at the very least at the entrance, and communication, and now we have innovation that may be useful. In the north of France, I've got a pilot study going on where we're tracking. What we did is on a swine farm, we put a bunch of beacons. They're little things like that, okay? We even put them on the cleaning equipment. And every employee has uh, basically an app, and uh, if they get close to the beacon, they're being recorded. And so we know uh, where they are, uh, how much time they're spending there, uh, including uh, using the equipment, cleaning equipment. And it's in real time uh, information. And in a nutshell, here uh, we had one farm with four, uh, three employees. And, uh, and basically, uh, we want to know also if they were going in the right direction. This was a furrow to finish operation. And uh, we had a few occasions where they would go from the finishing unit, um, you know, back to post winning. Uh, basically not going uh, properly uh, about 8% of the time. And here we could see that one employee was uh, uh, more likely to do this than the other ones. The idea here is not to use that to punish, but to train. So that can be useful. Uh, another technology we're testing right now, we just completed a study uh, using the RFID uh, technology here real time 
And basically, we, here's the, the, the red line, essentially. And what we did is we put microchips in the boots. And the employees allowed us to put microchips on their boots so that we would know if they would use their own boots to cross that line, okay? Um, and so we uh, did that just for a few days, um, 17 days, four different employees, 254 entries. And the compliance was at 93% for the boots. There were nine non-compliant shoe events, and, and basically two out of nine. Uh, they got a feedback if they would cross if that microchip would cross the line and it would be the wrong microchip, okay, there would be an alarm. And so, um, and this is technology used in hospitals. Uh, they can also uh, send you um, uh, basically a text message to inform you. And the idea there is that you get immediate uh, feedback. You can also do it as we did for the alcoholic, um, alcohol gel. Um, if you push it or uh, if you don't push it then you cross that line, it will send you a message and, and buzz an alarm saying, well, you know, we didn't have this push on the uh, dispenser, uh, so you probably did not disinfect uh, your hands. Uh, and when it comes to hand washing, it was 68% compliance. Uh, once in every three uh, buzzers, they corrected once they heard the buzzer for an overall 80% compliance, which is not perfect, but it's better. It's important to look at these technologies because we know that is important. In human medicine, look at the data, okay? Um, this is in hospitals. Hand washing, physician, less than 50%. Okay, that was a long time ago. Dentist changing gloves, 63% of the time in 95, okay? Uh, intensive care, if you ever end up in intensive care and you are awake, okay, check what's going on there. It's remarkable. Okay, 71% compliance only for hand washing. So what they figured out is that basically in two departments, their compliance for hand washing was no more than 50, 60%. But if they had good training and real-time feedback, immediate feedback, they could reach over 80 to 90%. So that's why it's important. Now a few words about regional perspective. Um, it was minus 41 degrees when that picture was taken, okay? Um, and uh, when it's that cold, the air is uh, very dense and you see these clouds sometimes, very low clouds of humidity, going farm to farm. There were actually three farms there, okay? Now, business-wise, there are three farms. But my point is that for nature, this is just one big, fat, juicy site, okay? For a virus, a bacteria, they don't care. That because account, you know, accounting and biology are two different things. In terms of epidemiology, this is just one site because they're so close to one another. In Georgia, because of high density, what they've done, am I, do I have a couple more minutes? No, I have no time. Okay, uh, well, they've been using GPS. I'm going to move on. Now we can do it uh, with um, geofencing, virtual um, fencing. Uh, if you have any interest in that, that's very interesting because it's real time, um, basically feedback, uh, and, and where you can then contact the people who are crossing that virtual line, which is really nice. Um, and I'm going to finish with the pink screw. Essentially, this is uh, in North Carolina, uh, Goldsboro Milling. Uh, what they've done is employees, uh, technicians, they, uh, uh, the, the farm owner or the technician, if they have a suspicion of anything, they can put a laminated sheet, pink sheet with a plus in it, and they put that at the entrance. And that triggers uh, calls to all the people you see there. It's very low tech, but it works quite well. At first, people, the growers didn't like it, uh, to a point though where it actually was the opposite. They realized they had no more visitors and they wanted to keep it on, okay? Uh, but that's not how it works, all right? So I'm finishing um, with, uh, with this. Uh, we basically need to have integrated farm measures, traffic flow, managed traffic flow at a regional basis, good communication and good compliance, thinking about these basic principles of reducing contamination, separating it from healthy animals, and communicating at a regional level. Thank you very much.